Good afternoon. Welcome to our last session in March, Wednesday, March 31. It's Math 208, Elementary Statistics. This is just a review session for your questions, but I thought I'd put some reminders on the table for you. Remember, you have exam two now posted on our website. It's due by 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday, April 6. You're finishing up now. April is our last month. Your Newton Alta assignments, one through 26, the first 26 out of the 30, your recommended completion date on that is Monday, April 12. After you hand in your homework or your exam next week, April 6, you'll get a new written homework that's due one week later on April 13. Remember all Newton Alta assignments, there are 30 in all. You're required to have those completed by 11.59 on Monday, April 26. So you have the month of April to finish up working on those. Catch up, make sure you fill in that part of your grade. Now, this review session is only for your questions. I have nothing prepared for you. So you put your questions into the chat window or you can speak your questions out loud. I have no trouble either way you want to do it. And I will let you get to your questions. I am just cleaning up papers and working at my desk. So I'll let you ask the questions and most likely I'll mute the microphone until you pop in with a question. Morning, Braden. I'm just uh, sitting here in the review session. And it's like I said to everyone else, you can pop in with a question or you can throw your question in the chat. These are some reminders. As people pop in, I'll remind them about the exam due next week. Newton Alto assignments that you're finishing up in April. After you have your exam handed in, there'll be another written homework due a week later. Remember, all Newton Alta assignments have to be finished by Monday, April 26, before we do our last exam. So if you want to bring a question, go ahead. Or if you just want to sit and work, I'm just cleaning up papers and working at my desk here.
Let me look into that. Um, I do have the solutions to that problem posted. So I don't mind bringing them up and looking at them. The question is practicing Z scores like on last night's homework. Let me get that problem out. So on our website, homework nine solution is posted. Uh, before I say that, I better make sure of that, right? I thought I, I think I posted it early this morning. Let me double check. Mm, yes, homework nine solution is posted. So I can open that up and share that with you. And then I'll share my screen. Okay, put that away, put that away. Share screen. Got it. So uh, I think what I could do that would help you a little bit is to make sure you see the answer to this problem graphically. So you had two homework problems that you submitted last night. I haven't started reading them yet, so I don't know what everybody did. But one of them was a Z test and one of them was a T test. A Z test just means you're doing the test with a standard normal distribution. And a t-test means you're doing it with a t-distribution. As far as shapes go, they're very, very similar. So when we show you the picture of the two shapes, you say, that's the same shape. But they're slightly different, the standard normal distribution is famous, the t-distribution varies with the degrees of freedom. And if you want to look at this image right here, let me make sure I'm sharing this image with you. This image has everything you need to know to perform the test. Once we calculated the z-score, it turned out to be relatively high 2.7194. I'll tell you how we calculated that in a second. And for a level of significance in a two tailed test at 5%, that means 2.5% area shaded at the bottom of the graph, left tail, 2.5% area shaded at the top of the graph, right tail. The cutoff would be a z-score of 1.9600. I rounded off all these numbers to four decimal places. So our z-score, our test statistic is way above that. Now the test statistic is in blue, the z-score. Critical value is in red. It's the value that produces the area of 5% left and right tail. And so the area that I shade left and right tail in this picture, you can hardly see it. There's this little blue thorn at the end of each part of that distribution. And that area turned out to be 
that's called the p-value, that area, 0 0.00654. So that p-value is way below alpha. The p-value is less than alpha. So we have to reject the null hypothesis. Now let's work backwards. Let's take it from the top. Uh, before I do that, just give me a nod one way or the other. This is the kind of question you're asking about, because I'll show you where all those numbers came from. But first, is this, am I off base or is this the kind of question you're looking for? Okay, good. So now let's take the question from top to bottom. So I'm gonna go back to this problem and I'm gonna magnify that a bit before I share it with you again. Let me get rid of those, excuse me. And now I'll share this page with you again. And this is gonna be helpful for everybody, recording or live. So let's take it from the top. There's a group of students transferring from community college to a four-year college. They wondered if they're gonna spend the same amount of money on books and supplies as they have at the community college. So they made a survey, 54 people at the community college, 66 students, I should say students in both cases, at the local four-year college, asking them how much to spend on books and supplies. At the community college, it was $947 a year. At the four-year university college, it was $1,011 a year. Now, the problem says the population standard deviations are known to be 154 and 187. And that's the key phrase right there. As soon as they said the population standard deviations are known then you were in section 10.2. And you have to use this particular set of formulas that I have on the paper. So you have to be looking for the keywords in the problems like that. But the population standard deviations are known to be 154 and 187. Conduct a hypothesis test to tell if, here's another keyword, the means are the same. So this is a test of equality. They want to know just, do you spend the same amount of money or do you not spend the same amount of money? That's gonna be in our null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. They did not say, you're looking for this keyword, do you spend more at the four-year college? Do you spend less at the four-year college? Do you spend more at the community college? Do you spend less at the community college? All they asked is if the means are the same. Do you spend the same amount at the four-year college? 5% significance level. That's going to indicate your level of confidence. 95%. So the first paragraph I wrote here, I just said, well, you got to make sure you're using formulas from section 10.2. And these are what they are when you're testing the differences you will make kind of a new standard deviation by mixing the two standard deviations together here. It doesn't highlight very well on my paper. And your test statistic is this Z value. This is a Z score because you know the population standard deviations. Now, I'm gonna shoot this to the next page because I had the other problem here too. So I continued my response on the second page. So now we're summarizing. Let me not show the graph yet. The graph's down here, excuse me. The graph's down here that I already showed you, but we'll come to that. So let's get our numbers together. We're surveying students spending on books and supplies at a community college and a four-year college. We surveyed this many students at each college. The mean 
the average amount in the survey among 54 students and 66 students were these two dollar amounts. And the standard deviation, not of the samples, but of the population, it's possible that the colleges keep records themselves, and many do, the standard deviation at the community college and four-year college for the whole population is $154.87 respectively. So I'm just naming all these numbers right here so I can stick them into the formula. This is what we said we were testing for. We're testing to see if there's any difference or are they the same? So the null hypothesis by our default assumption, the null hypothesis will be you're gonna spend the same amount. And you look at your surveys and you say, no, you're not gonna spend the same amount. You spend more at the four-year college. Uh, again, we don't know that because maybe we just surveyed people who bought expensive books. We want to know if this difference we're seeing is real or just bad luck choosing the people we surveyed. So we will assume first that the two means are the same. That makes the alternative. Literally, the two means are different. I've said this before, let me say it again here. I used H naught for null hypothesis, so does the book. I used H1 for the alternative hypothesis because HA is very hard to read on paper. Sometimes the A looks like a zero. When you say this is a two-tailed test, that refers to the graph that we're gonna draw later. And that is two-tailed means mu1 could be less than mu2 or mu2 could be less than mu1. Those are the two ways you could be different. The z-score we compute by sticking in those numbers that we were given in our table. And that's where we get this magic 27194, negative 2.7194. Negative z-score, then you're to the left of the distribution, positive z-score, you're to the right of the mean of the distribution. So I want to add up all the area. Now I'll go to the picture. Below negative 2.794, 2.7194, and above 2.7194. And I did shade these blue in this picture. It's just, it's so small, it's hard to see that blue but it's coming through fairly well on my monitor if it's working for you. Now, how much area when I did that shading? Well, I can do that by just asking for the normal CDF, the normal cumulative distribution function on my calculator. Ask the calculator how much area is under a standard normal distribution, mean zero, standard deviation one from infinity negative to negative 2714 and from 2714 on the right to positive infinity. Both of those numbers were about 0 0.003270 and you add them together, that means you double them, you got 0 0.006540. And we could demonstrate this on the calculator if you like these commands, but these commands are the ones that are built into your calculator. And look at that, 006, that is less than 1%. 1% 1 is 0 0.01. So this is less than 1% of the area. And looking at my graph, I kind of believe it. That blue stuff was very little of that area. But what am I supposed to compare the p-value to? The alpha, the alpha was the level of significance. That's the 5%. So I need to shade 5% under the standard normal curve left and right. That's 2.5% left, 2.5% right. And I get that number, 19600. Again, I could use the inverse normal command on my calculator to find out where 5% is in the two tails. That means 2.5% right, 
two and a half percent left. Two and a half percent is very small, but less than one percent is even smaller. So that number, that cutoff value, it's called the critical value, is 1.9600, almost two standard deviations. And that's why I say the p-value, the blue area, is less than alpha, the red area. And that's the signal that the difference we see in our data is not due to random chance. It's very unlikely. By this p-value, six times in a thousand, if I did this survey 1,000 times, only six times would I see such a difference. And that means, oh, only six times would I see that kind of difference right here. That means that these two things are naturally different. The mu1 and mu2 are not equal, but accidentally different in my surveys. So that means reject H naught. Let's go back up here to H naught. H naught said I spent the same amount of money on average in the books. So I am going to reject that and say in my English conclusion, there is sufficient evidence to support the hypothesis that the mean yearly amount spent on books and supplies at the four-year college is different from the mean yearly amount spent on books and supplies at the community college. Notice I just said the amount spent was different. I did not say larger or smaller. We could have tested for larger or smaller. Somehow we believe it's larger, but I have a strong belief that it's different. Okay, so when you are doing these problems yourself, and, and this is where you could apply it to the test, you know, definitely you calculate the p-value and compare it to alpha. You make sure you state clearly whether you're rejecting H naught or not rejecting H naught. Remember, the choices are not reject or accept. The choices are reject H naught or do not reject H naught. And then say in English what that means. There is sufficient evidence for blah, 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 or there is insufficient evidence for blah, 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 depending on what your problem is. If you can bring it, and I think on the test questions, I often said, I want a graph. Now you could produce a graph on your calculator. You could produce this graph I have in front of you on your calculator. And then you can, you know, screenshot or take a picture and trim it to fit on your paper. Or you can use Desmos. I use Desmos right here because it allowed me to write stuff on it too. Or you could just have the calculator screen or the Desmos screen in front of you and you can sketch this neatly by hand. I don't mind if you do that either. But bringing this picture makes it really, really clear to you which area is the winner, which area is the bigger and it helps communicate what your conclusion is to the other people. So this problem here, I wanted to do really, really detailed and post it so you guys could also use it as a model in your work. Let me get out of that page and see if that's uh, a good deal and tell me if that was helpful. And uh, let me write down exactly what we looked at, just to make sure everybody else viewing this recording later. Sees what we were looking at. I said this to everyone in the recording last week, and that is, you think, and I'll share this paper with you again. You think of this graph, let me bring the graph back. 
is kind of like the scoreboard. Uh, opening day of the baseball season is tomorrow, right? Oh boy, I'd like to get tickets to an opening day. In fact, I looked at some tickets to an opening day. Just maybe, just maybe I could go to a game. Nope, two, three hundred dollars a ticket. And that's just the cheap ones. But let's just pretend everything's normal and you're at a baseball game because I guess as far as watching, I, I like baseball the best. Doesn't matter, baseball, basketball, football, soccer. First thing you do when you walk in the stadium is you look at the scoreboard because the scoreboard is going to tell you exactly what's happening. You know, 10-0 for your team. Okay, this is going to be fun, maybe. 0-10 for your team. Okay, I think I'm going to walk around and get some food. You need to think of the distribution, the standard normal distribution or the T distribution, either one, as the scoreboard that shows you the score of this game you're playing. Well, more specifically, this test that you're conducting. In the next problem, you got a similar curve, although this is a T distribution, not a standard normal distribution. And here, the score of this game is much, much closer. The critical value is minus 1.3002, and the test statistic is minus 1.366. Again, the test statistic is outside. The p value is less than alpha. The blue area is less than the red area. So I will reject H naught again. But do you see in this scoreboard? is a much closer score, is much tighter, this game, this test that we just conducted. So whenever you can, even if you're just doing it by hand on your paper, make a graph of the standard normal distribution. It's like drawing the scoreboard for people. Okay, that's what I wanted to emphasize there, if that helps. Let me write that down. Standard normal distribution, which is normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. Or T distribution with the appropriate number of degrees of freedom. On our homework you were submitting last night, the degrees of freedom was one of those crazy formulas. It's the T distribution. Let's slide my paper up. These are the scoreboards. that tell you the result. Instantly. Of your hypothesis test. Uh, let me get the paper posted up. So it's very helpful to add a drawing of that distribution to your hypothesis test. Okay. And when you're um, 
when you're on the scoreboard, you know, they got all kinds of things, you know, runs, hits, errors, and at bat, and they got the scoring play. I mean, a scoreboard at a baseball game, well, nowadays it's a giant entertainment thing. It's like a giant television in center field. But it also tells you, okay, who's up next? What's the batting average? How many home runs, singles, doubles, triples? Everything is on the scoreboard. And for the same thing for us, when you're doing a hypothesis test, when you're doing statistics in general, everything is on that graph of the distribution. Okay, somewhere, there's a clock tower, bringing a bell outside in some particular way. And I don't recognize it because it's one o'clock. So you should just get one dong and that's it. I don't know if you can hear that ringing. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why they're ringing. But figure it out later. Yeah, yeah. I, even 13 times I would understand. I agree with you. But And uh, OK, Easter's coming up. This is Wednesday. Maybe they're ringing it for some festival. That's another suggestion. Okay, so you hang out. I'm just going back to my papers, but if you have another question, you can still bring it. That was a good question. Yeah, if I can say something else while I'm just clicking keys here on my keyboard in another window. You're going to start to see in the statistics class now in the remaining of the week that this is pretty much what all our jobs are going to look like. We are described a situation. We have to decide what test we're going to use. We will do a calculation to figure out where we're supposed to shade an area on one graph or another. And then by that area shaded, we'll decide whether the result we have is supporting or not supporting whatever hypothesis we were trying to check. So this is going to be the common way we walk through 
just about all of our problems down. We don't always use the standard normal distribution or the T distribution. We're going to introduce some new distributions next week. But we're always interested in cutting some curve off at a point and saying how much area is there. Let me check that out. The suggestion is problem 121 in chapter eight. Okay, okay, let me, let's look at that question and see what we got there. I can pull it up on the screen if we like, but first, just scan it in my book here. Population proportion, my page is glued together. This is problem 121. So this is the one that reads, uh, you're referring to an article on interracial dating and marriage recently appeared in the Washington Post. 1,709 randomly selected adults, 315 described themselves as Latinos, so they break down the people by the way they describe themselves. Latinos, Blacks, Asians, Whites. Uh, now, when, and when you read questions like this, remember I'm reading the questions as they're written. And when you look at things like this, even things in recent history, sometimes the labels they apply to people are very dated. So, in, anyway, it says in this survey, 86% of Blacks said they would welcome a white person in their family. Among Asians, 77 would welcome a white person in their family. 71 would welcome a Latino. 66 would welcome a Black person. So that's problem 120. Now, 121 says, using the same information, construct three confidence intervals. First, the percent of all Asians who would welcome a white person in their family. Second, percent of all Asians who would welcome a Latino person in their family. Third, percent of all Asians who would welcome a black person in their family. And then it says, even though the three point estimates are different, do any of the confidence intervals overlap? And then for any of the intervals that do overlap, in words, what does this imply about the significance of the differences in the true proportions. And then for any intervals that do not overlap, what does this imply about the significance of the differences in the two proportions? Okay, so why don't we just work this out? And let's write this down and write down some data and we'll pull it up on the screen if we have to. So the question is, um, 121 chapter eight, which is under 8.3, which talks about population proportions and confidence intervals. So even here, I have to choose the formulas to use according to the problem that I'm given. The confidence interval in general
is some point estimate minus some error estimate. It slid off the page there. Let me bring it over and up. Make sure everything happens here. Up to some point estimate. Plus some error estimate. So you need to know what is the point estimate and what is the error estimate. In the population proportion, and I can show you the page where they define this for you, but the point estimate is a sample proportion. If we're talking about proportions, the point estimate must be the sample proportion that you've taken from a survey. And people call that P prime. And the error estimate is called the error bound for proportions. And that has a specific form. And in this case, it uses a z-score times a specific standard deviation. The standard deviation in this problem is going to be p prime q prime divided by n sample size. So I'll show you in the book where I would find these. And then I'll show you how to calculate them. I'll tell you what all the letters mean. But this is literally in section 8.3 of the book. So let me make sure you know where that page is. I'll open up the book to that page on my screen. And then I'll share the screen with you. Got it. Back to our thing, got it. Share screen right there. Okay, we're sharing the screen right here, good. So this is section 8.3 where you talk about the confidence interval for a population proportion. In that case, the distribution is a normal distribution, so we use a z-score, and the standard deviation is going to be computed by n times p times q square rooted over n. Now p is the probability of success, q is the probability of failure, or you could say it this way, p is the probability of people responded in the way you were counting, and q is the probability that people responded in the other way. You know, what is your age? 16 or older, that was a success. 15 or below, that was a failure. So it's the thing that you're counting. You're measuring the proportion of the thing that you're counting. So P prime is the point estimate for the true proportion. It's what your sample told you the proportion was. It's made out of number of successes divided by size of the sample. And the error bound for the proportion is a z-score of alpha over two times the standard deviation square root of p prime q prime over n. A p prime and q prime are the probabilities of success and failure in your sample. So let's go read this problem specifically, and then we'll fill this in on our paper. I'm shifting my paper and I'll bring this up in front of you on the screen just so we can read the key points. Problem 121 uses the information from problem 120. 
And again, I'm just going to read this as it's written with the terms that they use to describe things here. Okay, let me bring this window over to the next screen so I can look at it with you. Get rid of that screen, keep that screen, stop sharing, and go back to my paper. There's my paper. Okay, got it. So I want, I'm trying to move this window out of my way so I can see my paper totally, and the window is fighting me. Okay, very good. So I want to construct 95% confidence intervals. Three 95% confidence intervals. That means that the alpha, the level of significance is 5%. And you should be comfortable expressing percentage as decimal or percentage, 0.95 or 5%, 95% or 0 0.05. Okay, that means on my scoreboard, I'm drawing a tiny scoreboard here. I want to know where 5% of the area is, left and right under standard normal distribution. I'm using a standard normal distribution because it's a population proportion. They told me to use a standard normal distribution. Now, I already know from the previous problem that in order to get 5% area in both the tails added together, 2.5%, 2.5%, the cutoff value is 1.9600. But I'll show you that on the calculator in a second. So, the point estimate, and let's look at part A or part one. Part one was percent of Asians who would welcome a white person into the family. And in this survey, it said 77% would welcome a white person into the family. Good, so that's our P prime. So what's our error bound? for this proportion. It's the Z alpha over two. That means the place where 2.5% is above the mark. That's the 19600 times square root of P prime, Q prime divided by N. Now the tricky thing is I gotta figure out what the N is in this problem. So I'll go back and scan 120. 1,700 adults, how many describe themselves as Asian? 254. So in this problem, N is 254. P prime, we read was 77%. And that means the opposite of that would not welcome Q prime is 23%. So these are the numbers that I'm gonna to toss in here. 1.96 is the number I'm gonna to toss in there. And then that's what I'm gonna plus or minus for my confidence interval. My 95% confidence interval. So I'm gonna switch the calculator to show you how I find that Z alpha over two to demonstrate where I got that 196 from, even though I'm borrowing the 196 from the previous problem where we already did it. So let me pop open the calculator. And show you I'll have to share that screen with you as soon as it comes up. Got it. Share screen. Calculator. 
Got it. Got some other graph we were doing last time. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. So under distribution, normal cumulative probability distribution, I want to know from the lower to the upper where I would find 95% of the area. And I could just guess here, if I put in one point with standard normal distribution, zero and one for the mean and standard deviation, I get 97.5%, that's 2.5% above. But if I wanted to calculate exactly, I don't get it exactly here, right? So I calculate exactly, I use the inverse norm. Number three, I want an area of either two and a half percent right. If you like, we'll write two and a half percent right. In the standard normal distribution, mu zero, sigma one. And let's paste that. Here's the number exactly, 1.9599640. That's what I rounded off to 1.9560. Rounding off to four decimal places is relatively fair. You wanna see it in the drawing. Well, then let's draw the normal distribution shaded. So let's draw it from 1.9600 to infinity, one times 10 to the 99th power, mu zero sigma one, magenta is a little bit loud for me. Let's change it to red. That's not so loud. Draw. Oh, okay, problem is I've already got this other graph here at the same time. So let's clear this, then let's draw it. Wow, it doesn't want to clear that magenta thing. So I hope I don't have the magenta thing burned into my screen. I don't appear to have it burned into my screen. Sometimes when you are trying to draw something else and an old graph shows up, make sure you're not drawing it somewhere else. Like in the Y equals menu. But I'll show you how to get rid of it if all else fails. So one more time, looking at that upper 1.9600 upper is, gosh, get the arrow going down there. Okay, now I got my keyboard and the keys on the screen and they don't cooperate. 1.966600, 1.9600, down, one times 10 to the 99th, draw. Okay, not getting rid of the pink thing, right? So go to a window and resize the window just slightly. Uh, how about negative four to four? That usually wipes the graphing window clean. So now let's try it. Distribution, draw, shade normal. Problem is I gotta re-enter this stuff, 1.9600. Upper value, one times 10 to the 99th. Now draw. Okay, so I got a clean drawing. So there's my 5% right there. Notice it says 2.5% on the right. If I want to add the other part, 2.5% on the left, then I guess this is the time I want to have the two things drawn at once. So I could do that right here by typing in minus 1.9600. Oh, it's the wrong minus key. I keep doing that. There, now I got a full 5%, 2.5% in each tail. Now, that number is what I want to use to calculate my error bound. So I take that 
1.9600, round off to four decimal places. Now I'm going to do times the square root of 0 0.77 times 0 0.23 probability of failure divided by, and the number of people I surveyed that were, said they were Asian, 254. Let's check that out. Zero point zero five one eight. So this turns out to be approximately zero point zero five one eight. I'm going to keep four decimal places right there. So now let's go back to the paper. And let's do 0.77 plus that, 0.77 minus that, 0.77 plus that, 0 0.8218, 0 0.77 minus that is 0 0.7182. You could do those two numbers on the calculator. Now, confidence interval, what were the names of these? And this is where their labels become very troublesome. So I almost don't like presenting this other than this is the way it was presented in the problem. Because this is too close to the current news, which is very awkward in many different news stories. Okay, now let's check out the intervals for the other ones. Now, to welcome Latino, to welcome black person in the family, the only thing that's going to change are these two numbers right here, P prime and Q prime. So in the second part, let me slide that up. What's the P prime? Would welcome Latino into the family. 71% would welcome Latino person into the family. So their P prime is 0 0.71. And Q prime was zero point, sorry, zero point two nine. And I can put those numbers into here. Those are the only things that change. Still have two hundred fifty four Asian people surveyed. Still have the Z alpha over two is one point nine six. So let's run that on the calculator. I just have to repeat the last command and change the two numbers from 77 to 71, from 23 to 29. That is an error bound proportion of 0 0.55058, 0 0.0558. Now remember, I'm subtracting from and adding to 0.71, not 0.77 anymore. So let's do 0.71, go back to my paper for you, recording wise. If you're listening to this live, you can look at any screen I'm giving you, but for the recording, let's record this paper. 0.71 plus or minus this error bound. So plus is 7658. And minus is 6564, 6442. I'm actually going to type that on my calculator to make sure I'm not screwing up in my own calculation. 7 fun minus 0 0.0558. Six five four two. So 
See, I shouldn't trust myself. Six, five, four, two. And this label, according to the book, was Asian family welcoming a Latino by marriage. What do these confidence intervals say? You don't know the true proportion of Asian families that would welcome either one. And that's going to be a judgment of each individual person. But you're guessing between 72 and 82% would welcome a white person. Between 65 and 76% would welcome a Latino person. Let's do the same calculation for the reporting of all Asians who'd welcome a black person in their family. That P prime was reported at 0 0.66. And that would make the Q prime is 0 0.34. And so when we do the error bound for the proportion there, again, we just have to change those two numbers in our last calculation. What's the error bound for the proportion there? Let me go back and share the calculator with you again. And all I have to do is a second function entry and change these to 6, 6 and 3, 4. Because I'm using the same Z alpha over 2, the same confidence level, 95%, the same number of people surveyed. This is 5, 8, 3, 0 0.058. Three. Now 66% plus that is 7183. And 66% minus that, which I'm again going to check on my calculator, 6017. Double checking on my calculator. 0 0.66 minus. 0 0.0583. I typed in the number wrong. 0 0.66 minus 0 0.0583. 6017. Okay, I got it right. And this was, according to the problem, Asians welcome black person and this was in each case by marriage okay so what did they want to ask you in the last two questions in this book it said for any of the intervals that overlap what does that mean about the significance of the differences in the true proportions and for any intervals that do not overlap, what does that mean about the significance and the difference of the two proportions? So let me draw that for you on the piece of paper like this. And this will be more meaningful to you. So let's say all these numbers ran from 60 to 82, right? So let's run this and let's call this 60%. One, two, three, four, five, seventy percent. One, two, three, four, five. I'm counting marks on my paper. Oh, let me go back and share my paper with you. Eighty percent. So I want to show you these confidence intervals all three together in a graphical way. Okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five, this would be 90%. We never got up there. So each one of these marks on the thing is 2% because there's five marks between each. So the first mark, let's put that in one color. 
And that is from 71 to 82. And that's approximately almost 72 to 82. And that's approximately like this. Now I'm just drawing this very casually with my pen on the scale. So this was the response to question one, Asians welcoming white person by marriage. And then next color, welcoming Latino. Let's draw that in blue, 65 to 76. So 65 is about right there. 76 about right here. I know it wasn't exactly 76, I'm just checking. There we go. And last one, Asians welcoming black 60 to 71, approximately 72 almost. 60, 72, and this was the third case. Okay, so forget about the labels. Let me make sure I, whatever they represented, which was odd. But let's look at the three intervals. Remember the red interval just tells you where you think the proportion of the first case is. You're not certain. The true proportion of the first case should be within this red interval from 71.8 to 82.2, but you're only 95% certain that that's gonna happen. Second interval, blue, between 65.4 and 76.6. .6. But again, you're only 95% sure that the truth lies in there. But it's possible that the truth proportion, remember the center is P prime, but the true proportion could be over here for this case. The true proportion in the second case there's the sample, but the true proportion could be over here. So it could be that the Asian families that welcome white and welcome Latino have the same proportion, really. And we don't know within the margin of error of our poll. And it could be that the Asian families that welcome the same proportion of either Latino or Black are in the same overlapping interval, but we're not certain. It does not look like purple interview interval overlaps red interval, and certainly not by numbers. Uh, 713, 7183, 7182. I guess the red and the purple one do overlap. So it's possible that they overlap and the number of the proportion of Asian families that welcome white and the proportion of Asian families that would welcome a black person by marriage could be the same. So these error bounds, these intervals are telling you that you're not sure where the exact number is, but you're giving someone a range within 95% confidence. Now to me, personally, I'm not gonna say that it makes sense to have such a discussion but I was just executing the problem. So I'm gonna leave the problem at that. That's what they wanted. These are the descriptors they used. I'm not comfortable talking about groups in that fashion. Okay, I'm not saying there's no such thing as prejudice or preferences. I'm just saying I don't, think that that's always a useful conversation. But the problem, the calculating and the problem, this is useful. Okay. We have another five, eight minutes here, five, 10 minutes here to go. If you'd like to bring another question, you're welcome to do that. Uh, it's 1.44. And we can scan a question quickly. Or if you want to see a sample question that's a little bit longer, we can do like last time is I could put up the answer on our website. 
later and you could scan the question that way. But this is two good things to practice, confidence intervals and hypothesis test. So that's worth practicing. Uh, I'm just trying to find my shoes and socks here. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. While you're working on the test over the weekend and such, you're also welcome to send me questions by email. If I can answer them, I will. Or if I can point you to a good example, I will. But I think uh, these are good illustrations that you, what situation am I dealing with? What formulas or tests should I be using? And then I have to execute them and interpret them. That's the common theme in the work we've done here today so far. I'm still just cleaning up the papers on the desk here. Papers and pens.
after we end the session, I'll get these scanned and posted as soon as possible, video wise. Not sure if I can get it done quickly today because of some other appointments, but I'll get it posted as quickly as possible. Is there anything else you want to throw on the board? Anybody before we wrap this up and process the video and post it? If not, then I'll copy these papers and post this video as soon as possible. Oops, sorry. I kicked the camera again. And if you have any other questions, you just shoot them to me over the weekend on the email. Have a good weekend.